We see death and dying on the TV and movies every day. But when it comes into our own lives, if a loved one is dying, or ourselves, we often don't know what to say or do. Dying is something we all have to face at some time. We only get one shot at it, so why are we so unprepared? Viewers of all cultures will relate to, cry with and celebrate the triumphs of our nine families as they disclose intimate details of how they coped with a sudden death or a life-limiting disease. Feel their raw emotional pain and deep love. Dying to Live is a timeless, controversial documentary series that takes us on a real-life emotional roller coaster. Memorable, inspirational and deeply helpful as we face the fears common to all of us who travel towards our final journey. Last Sunday I thought that was the day or the evening, so sometimes I feel like, uh-uh, today's the day, I'd better tell Lynn to check me in the morning. But then I open my eyes on I'm here again. <laughs> this is not supposed to happen. I'm a mother of three young children and that's just not how it works. That's just not what's supposed to happen. One does not know how you will cope unless you, you're, you're actually faced with a situation. There were times when people probably didn't know what to say to me so they they probably didn't come and talk to me. When we were first told, I um, just wanted to run away. I didn't want to hear what she had to say. And then the next visit, doctor told me that, um, yes, I had one year to live, if that. So I thought, oh, well, this is going to be a tough one, so, and then I think about my friends, but I don't seem to worry about myself. That's tough. I'm 72 nearly, and I've had a wonderful life. I've had probably 90 years of life in 72 years, so I'm um, ready for whatever happens, and it might be a new dimension I go to that's interesting. The doctor um, sat me down, and he just said to me, well, it's not what we expected. And I actually initially thought, oh, how lovely, something exotic or something different, or oh, I wonder what it is. And then he said, cancer. He could have whacked me with a cricket bat against the wall. I think I kept saying, me, are you sure? And he said to me, um, yes, this is the report. This is your name and this is your address. And these are the results and I'll read them to you. And so he sort of tried to prove to me that it was true. Most people who face a life-limiting illness, I believe, um, do think about the idea of ending their own life, even if fleetingly, and even if um, for their own spiritual beliefs would never do it. I think it's something that crosses the minds of most people because the idea of facing a life-limiting illness is hard. It's, it's, um, it's something that stretches the human you know, ability we think about all sorts of possibilities. Out of all those people who think about it, um, for you know, many people it's just a fleeting thought and they go on to think about the people they leave behind, they go on to think about the things that they don't want to leave behind. Um, and most people find in there a will to live and most people find in there um, the ability to then go on. People who have thought about taking their own life, thought through that and gone past that process and got to a point where they found that will to live, will often say they're glad they didn't do it. Um, because hard as it is facing what you have to face when, when you have a chronic disease that's very disabling and continues and you know um, is the beginning of the end of life, life is very precious. and you only get to die once. Did you ever consider taking your own life when you were diagnosed? I did actually. But I was... <laughs> I 
And with Sam, I was very depressed at the time. And I think that's that's why I was, I was in a deep depression. My family, I couldn't, I couldn't do it to them. And I know it's not the right thing to do anyway. I'm just glad I'm still here. One of the things I think that happens is people don't know how to speak to, to you. That's one of the most common things. And they either avoid you, which I think is very unhelpful, uh, because the first thing you, uh, one of the things you do need often is to have that, just know if I've got support, I can make it through here. To, to have people who will come and say to you, um, you know, it's okay to cry with me and uh, it's quite safe, you're okay. To reassure people that they can cry. And if you feel like it, or feel you're getting to that point, you cry with them as well. They sort of, and they don't know what to say next. I've said to people, don't, don't be concerned. I mean, I'm still me. So, you know, talk about it, don't talk about it. Doesn't make any difference. When I was younger, I used to think, you know, macho, uh, real men don't cry. But unfortunately, if you want to keep sane, you have to. And people say to me, you know, you've got to be positive. You've got to be. I said, yes, I've, I am positive. I've been positive all this time. But you cannot be positive 24 hours a day seven days a week, 360 So you have to have unpositive witness. So what I do is I think, uh-uh, I'm feeling depressed, the black dog's coming on me, so I race into my room, shut the door, get under the blankets and bore my eyes out, and suddenly I think, oh, I've got to water the vegetables. So I think, all oh, right, I've had enough of that. We've been trained more to focus on the physical, although that's changing. And sometimes we become uncomfortable when we um, don't feel we've got anything physical that we can offer. So sometimes we avoid the dealing with the emotional. So, so I think giving that opportunity is really important. But the reason I say that um, we shouldn't assume that emotional things are important is that I think in different cultures and for different individuals, talking about emotion isn't necessarily the way to go. You know, so emotion can be expressed in many other ways than words. Emotions can be expressed in, in actions, in music, and in, in art, in, in just being with someone. So it, it doesn't, we shouldn't just assume that people have to verbalise. I think as a, as a man, you, you tend to be a, a bit of a Mr. Fix-It, um, particularly around the house and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, in, in a case like this, there, there really is not a lot that you can do and you've got to leave that in the hands of other people. Um, and so the only thing that I could set myself to do as a task was to simply provide Fiona with whatever support that I could. I actually said to him, look, if you don't think you can face this and go through this with me or you, I don't mind. If, if you decide that this is the end of the road for you. But just reach someone, because I'm sure if you're running away, you'll regret it. I'm sure you would.